Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. Welcome to the first Pit Lane Parlay IMSA episode of 2021. I almost forgot what year it was at this point. Trevor McClure joins me. Trevor, first off, thanks for joining, man. How's everything going down in Daytona? Well, it's uh, warm. So that's always a plus, uh, especially coming down from Canada. It's a nice change of pace. Uh, otherwise, it's been really good here, man. Uh, really good roar. Uh, as you and a lot of people know, this is our first year where we've had the roar and the race weekends back to back. So it's been a bit of a change and adjustment uh, fairly smoothly for a lot of people, us included. So it's uh, pretty good, man. Can't complain. So with the, the roar being the weekend before instead of traditionally where it's kind of like, uh, you know, three weeks before ish. How much more stress is that put on a on a team in terms of getting everything ready? You know, God forbid there's also an accident on top where now you have to fix the car in in you know short order, more 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 short order than usual. Yeah, I mean it's it's like everything else, like uh, setting up the car or anything else. It's there's trade offs, so there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Uh, one of the advantages being there is somewhat a bit of a reduction of stress in preparation for the event because now you have the whole first three weeks of january to do it instead of having to rush out the week you know or a week and a half after say christmas and even a day or two after new year's to get down to test days to get down there unpack run the event pack back up travel home and then have that two to three week period less travel time to then get ready for the race so uh it gives you more time to be prepared once you get here but as you mentioned the converse to that is if you do wad something up or have issues this week, you've literally got the two days of prep, which is yesterday and today, to fix that. And God forbid, if you need something, even a new tub, new chassis, new car, uh, that definitely is going to send that stress level past the red line. Um, but again, for us, it's it's been very good and it's a necessary change given the current situation with everything, especially since there are a lot of foreign teams, drivers, crew, uh, most of my AWA crew included being Canadian, uh, that have quarantine requirements when you return home. Yeah. So for us, we've stayed here in Florida in the interim, uh, even though we haven't had to do any work or prep the, the Monday or Tuesday, uh, simply because we couldn't return home because there's not enough time and it's, it's rather pointless. And of course, to increase risk of anything by traveling more and, and everything else. So... It's, uh, it's definitely necessary. Uh, and I think for the most part, it's been a positive change. Um, again, there's going to be trade-offs and there will be people, people that disagree because they've had issues now and they're having to get off the back foot and fix them. But uh, yeah, it is what it is, man. I think, it's, I think it's been quite nice. I like it. So for those listening, you are the race strategist and team chef for AWA and the Michelin pilot. And then spotting in the rolex 24 for the number 63 gtd ferrari 488 so you've got a you've got a busy weekend the the michelin pilot is what a four hour race on friday that's correct and then obviously 24 hours starting late saturday afternoon so i have to ask team chef what's on the what's on the menu on a race weekend uh well i like most things like to go overboard (laughs) <laughs> so, uh, for example, breakfast this morning was uh, avocado toast with a uh, lemon zest, sesame stuffed uh, croissants with sausage and wow. fontina cheese. Uh, but over the course of the weekend, we've had um, street tacos, uh, white chicken chili. Like I, I treat my guys and gal well um, because the, the food is, is the fuel for your crew and you put good quality fuel and enough fuel in your crew, you get better results. So we uh, we definitely don't skimp on the the food. We've even gone so far as to uh, build a custom kitchen that rolls in and out of the uh, the hauler like a toolbox. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's been quite nice. So it's it's a good setup, and you know, again, I'm I'm happy to do it. Seeing them fed and watered is uh, brings a smile to my face. Yeah, so I know whose pit box to be near whenever media are allowed back in person. Uh, if you see me, if you see some guy in a black polo, it, uh, that's me hanging out waiting for uh, a good meal. So, I'll save your plate. perfect. Also, your 
spotting for the GTD car in the 24 hour race. So I, I understand that I believe, you know, spotters typically rotate throughout the 24 hour race. How many spotters do you have on the car and what's it like from, from a spotter's standpoint, spotting during a, a 24 hour race? I mean, typically you'll, you'll have two and we'll, uh, we'll work in shifts. Uh, people have done the, the full 24 solo. Um, though I think a lot of those guys have opted not to do that this year as we're all meant to be on the roof. Typically they give us an option to spot from the roof or the fifth level media center. Right. Uh, obviously with COVID being that nobody's going indoors. So everybody's on the roof. Um, and that, you know, it's daunting enough to do a fairly long shift, uh, six, eight, 10 hours up there on the roof because the, the rooftop of Daytona midway through the 24 hour is the coldest place on earth irrespective of ambient temperature. So it does wear on you. Um, but for me, my, uh, my tagline is real spotters do it on the roof. And that's actually uh, a little jab at some of my friends who like that media center down there in level five. But, uh, you know, it'll be like, uh, like Batman and Bane. They'll, uh, they'll only have accepted the darkness where I was born in it. So uh, for me, the, the long stints, the cold temperatures and everything, it's just, uh, it's just doing the job, man. So uh, it's not going to be too much of an issue. Me personally, I, I've done the 24 hours straight, uh, no sleep as a crewman um, and everything. So that's fine. But for me, I got to have a little bit of rest just because of the responsibility and liability you put on yourself with that car. You just have to be sharp and there's no sense in uh, staying up 24 hours just to say you've done it to wreck a car. Yeah, I tried to do that last year and I made it about till. God, I don't know, four o'clock in the morning before I was like, wow, if I don't get sleep now, I'm going to fall asleep standing up. So I definitely, I definitely understand that. So this year we've got the addition of the LMP3 class, which I'll talk a little bit more about in our overall IMSA preview that's coming tomorrow. But there's been a lot of chatter that the LMP3 class has added a lot of interest this year i'm trying to figure out like the nice way to put it it's been it's been very interesting to watch them so far so from your point of view what what has lmp3 added to the field and uh what are people saying about it uh it's added concern (laughs) that's Um, a better way of putting it when when they announced it it took about four and a half seconds for me to call that there was going to be all sorts of issues with the gt cars Uh, especially when you look at the quick guys in the P3 cars are turning about the same lap time as the factory guys in LM cars. So you've got that component, but then you look at it a little further and realize that the P3 and the GTLM cars make their lap time and their speed in two totally different places. So they're always going to be intermingling, even if one is a touch quicker than the other because they're going to get there in different places. Obviously the, the P3 cars have a bit of a deficit with, um, with engine power, but they're higher downforce, lighter weight. So in the brake zones and mid corner, they're going to be superior to the LM cars. And uh, that's just going to cause concern. And then you look at it in practice, as we've seen over the course of the week, and especially in the hundred minute race on Sunday, is you've got some of these bronze drivers in the P3 cars who are struggling to maintain GTD pace. So now you've got both ends of that LMP3 spectrum uh, intermingling with every GT car on track. And um, again, it's the same deal. They make their speed in two totally different places in totally different ways. Um, And just you can look at uh, what played out in the 100 minute race where four of the seven LMP3 cars DNF'd. And I think the highest finishing LMP3 car would have been seventh or eighth in GTD. And that's only 7% of the race length that we have this coming weekend. Um, so I'll make the bold prediction here and now that the, the guys who get Rolexes for the P3 class won't be racing at the end of the race. I think they're oh. all, all going to end up uh, in a garage or there's going to be mechanical issues. That's the other other layer to this whole ordeal is these cars are fairly new. They have different spec engines in them and they're relatively unproven. It's, uh, it's kind of the, uh, the Kevin Buckler syndrome with, with TRG when they won overall at Daytona, the DP was new and the 997 was new and they made the wise decision to go to the, the 996 cup car that was tried and true. 
and everything around them DNF'd and they they won by uh, by default. So I think you have an un, unproven piece with the the mixture of mandated bronze drivers and just the the pace that these cars are turning at Daytona relative to one another. I think it's a recipe for um, yellows is a nice way to put it. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that's a much better way of what I put. It. All as I know is I I missed most of Sunday. And then I logged into social media and saw you and about 15 other people going, well, that's what we expected. And I had to catch myself up as to what was going on. And uh, real quick, speaking of this weekend, so or last weekend, Saturday was the qualifying race for qualifying. And then Sunday was qualifying for the 24. It feels like a bit of overkill looking at it from an outsider's perspective was one of those events, maybe Saturday, kind of not as important as it, it typically would, uh, as it should be or was. Well, I mean, uh, it's it's IMSA trying new things, and I'm I'm all for that. Um, yeah. I'm not totally on board with you know the new point system where qualifying does issue points and matter. Um, I'm still on the fence with it, but I do appreciate the fact that IMSA is uh, trying some new things. Although I think, as you put it, qualifying for the qualifying race to qualify for the 24 hour. Um, could be a bit confusing to to some people, especially uh, you know the casual fan or the layman. So um, maybe it was a bit much. And I think you know they they introduced that qualifying race as a way to um, give incentive to mitigate sandbagging for the race. And uh, I I don't know that they achieved that um, in a number of classes. Uh, obviously, uh, Nasser had a very vocal opinion about that that showed up on on social media and a number of racing outlets and um you know I, I can't say i disagree with them in any way yeah well that takes care of my next question there in terms of uh, what you thought so we'll go to our standard non-racing question here you get to invite three guests to dinner whether they are still on earth or not who are you inviting and why are they on your dinner party list oh man okay and just the racing related people? Uh, they can be anybody. It can be, I mean, we've had, I think we had one that was like Obama, Jesus, and like Snoop Dogg or something. It was like a totally insane trio. So you can go in whatever direction you want. Fair enough. Since I'm, uh, since I'm in race mode, we're down here. It's the event. I'll keep it to racing people. Uh, man, that's, that's a tough one. Um, I think Michelle Mouton is going to end up on there. Um, simply because she was uh, she was a badass and she could drive a car and didn't take any shit from anybody. And uh, yeah, she's going to have a lot of good things to say. Um, and I definitely want to listen to that conversation. I think too, um, I was always a big fan of Mika Hakkinen. So he's, he's on the list because he's, uh, you know, he's one of the few people that was ever able to take it to Schumacher. And um, yeah. He was still even, you know, up to last year, he was in the 10 hour at Suzuka in a GT3 car at, you know, age 57 or something. So uh, once a racer, always a racer. Uh, and then I think, uh, man, number three, it would be a toss up uh, between uh, Juan Manuel Fangio Ooh. or uh, Nicky Lauda. I think uh, either one of those guys are just going to be this an immense wealth of knowledge. Uh, and actually, the two of those, I have a, a segment on my social media at Straight Chicane on Instagram where I do Words of Wisdom Wednesday. And it's a, a racing or racing applicable uh, quote that uh, means something. And, and Fangio and, and Lauda come up quite a bit. Um, again, I think that would be an entertaining dinner with uh, Michelle, Mika, and uh, probably Juan Manuel Fangio. I think he... Uh, he blazed a lot of trails for a lot of people and he's still the, the winningest driver in percentage terms of formula one starts. So yeah, I think that, I think I'll, I'll go with those three. I like it. I think Juan Manuel Fangio doesn't get enough talk anymore, but I guess that's what happens when you raced God 60 or 70 years ago at this point, but really fascinating career to, to read about him. So obviously we've, we've talked about what's currently going on in IMSA, but how do you get from you know where you are now, spotting an IMSA and you know strategizing for the Michelin Pilot Challenge? You know what what got you to this point, and and how did you get started in motorsports to begin with? 
Well, man, I, uh, I always loved it. And, um, you know, I actually, I, I said this on another podcast, but what started it all for me was actually the need for speed video game on PlayStation <laughs> way back in the day. And so, you know, my car, my favorite car in that game was the McLaren F1 road car. And then so in the early days of search engines, I looked it up and then found out that there was a sport called Formula One and then kind of started getting into it. And then it was, you know, reading books and everything. And uh, I fortunately grew up uh, about an hour and a half away from BIR and midway through my high school career, they reopened it. So I was working corners there. I think the second or third event they had when they reopened the circuit. And uh, yeah, it just kind of started in flagging communications, started talking to guys, and then I started doing, you know, 12 and 13 hour enduros with SCCA with uh, Spec Miata guys and um, came up from there. I met uh, a former Grand Am driver who's now the race director at Action Express, but had his own team, Chris Mitchum. Um, we got together for one of the 13 hours. I just kind of came down with, uh, with no plan, no gig and no expectation of pay and impressed him. And then I ended up being his uh, employee number one when he and his dad started the team. And uh, yeah, I kind of got into it. And then as that team grew, I, I went from uh, just being uh, the guy who went and fetched food and wiped the car down to uh, doing all the logistics for the team, to calling the cars, to going over the wall, uh, to making org, org charts and, and just doing all the administrative stuff. So I, I literally did everything for that team short of driving the truck to the track and driving the car on the track. So, uh, yeah, I, I had a really diverse upbringing in terms of what I had my hand in and, and the things that I've done. And then, of, of course, I, I worked for Action Express for a number of years, started off doing uh, driver change and then evolved to the spotting. And I had some really good mentors there. Plus, I'd already been calling races for years, so I brought my own flavor to it. And, uh, yeah, just kind of have, have gone from there and have been able to, to survive <laughs> over the years across a number of different series and, you know, been fortunate enough to go overseas and, and spot and do uh, some strategy and call races and things too. So that's, uh, that's about it, man. But it was, uh, you know, I burned my twenties learning how to do all this stuff. So now I, uh, I get to be trusted with a radio <laughs> on top of a box or on top of a roof. I like it. So when a steer slightly off topic you mentioned spotting overseas your favorite track that's not in north america that i've been to or just in general uh that's a great question how about both all right um let's see i liked the bahrain international circuit okay uh, when we went out there we did the tcr and there's an asterisk to this there's a little bonus side reason i like the, the track as well but uh when we ran the TCR cars out there in the Middle East, it was, we ran the short course, which is, I guess, the, they call it the Oasis circuit. So it's, okay. uh, I, I, I named it the Lime Rock of the Middle East because <laughs> it's, it's 11 turns, one and a half miles, sounds very familiar, um, but it's, it's a very, very nice little circuit. Um, it was fun to, to watch a bunch of those cars bump around. Um, and I also got a little chuckle because I went to Bahrain and then I was coming straight off to, uh, to Sebring, so I had of course, uh, gear packed for Florida because it tends to rain. And uh, during one of our, our, rain, our races or practice sessions, it started to rain in Bahrain. And I just chuckled at the fact that I was probably the only idiot, idiot that had traveled to the Middle East with a rain jacket. And uh, I was sitting pretty and dry laughing <laughs> while I was uh, on the corner spotting for my guy. But that was, uh, that was cool. And the Bahraini International Circuit also has a phenomenal go-kart circuit attached to it nice. it is amazing um the driver brandon godovic that went out there with me uh yeah i think we we spent a couple hours and a few hundred bucks on that thing just running around <laughs> <laughs> but yeah it was it was immense and uh yeah of course it's a bit of a culture shock when you go out there go out to uae to yas marina dubai and all that but it was uh it was just an awesome experience and i, I can't wait to go back uh, in terms of ones I haven't been to, um, I'm not gonna go, not gonna go with the the usual like uh, a Lama or a Mount Panorama or Spa or Nurburgring. Um, you know, I'm not totally sure where I would uh, where I'd like to go. Um, 
man, there's some, there's some historic circuits that don't exist anymore. Um, but I think uh, one of the ones I would like to check out is the one that uh, the 24 hour series actually uh, kind of brought back. That was, uh, forget the proper name of the track, but it's the one in Sicily that's around the lake. And they, they ran a 12 hour there last year and they're doing it again this year. And it was a really historic circuit. It's actually an endurance race or circuit that was run endurance races on that predates Le Mans. I think the first one that they did there was like somewhere deep in the 19 teens uh, when motor cars and motor racing were very much in their infancy. But so um, would this be the Sicilian circuit of Pergusa? That's it. All right. A quick Google search helped me out there. That's it. So I, I would like to go to that one. Um, I would like to go to Portimao. Um, I went to Yerez uh, year before last with Super Trofeo. I really enjoyed that circuit, and the town was super cool. Um, and of course, the uh, the ham is unbeatable in that region of Spain. So it's uh, yeah, it's quite good one. But there's too yeah. many. It's it's like a car. Know, it's like I what's know. your favorite car? There's so many good ones. <laughs> All right. So since you asked it, I'm going to go that direction now. I'm going to put you on the spot, but I'll I'll try to make it a little easier. What's the favorite your favorite car that you've you've been a, a, a team member on in in any capacity? Ooh, um, really good question. Uh, I've there's been quite a lot, and I really like a lot of them. I mean, I the the tube frame DPs, especially that last generation with the, the Corvette, obviously had a lot of success with those with the Action Express boys. Um, and that was that was quite a good time. And they just sound proper. I know that they were they were they were closer to a GT car than the, the carbon tub cars that we have today. Uh, but man, they were they just sounded awesome. They were fun to work with. They were they were Lego sets. They were easy to read build if you crashed one um the caddies now are the same way obviously with the uh, the engine sound um a little more complicated a little different to drive uh but you know that's those are kind of the boring answers because those are the high level stuff that we've always had in north american sports car racing um i've enjoyed you know the, the fifth gen camaro ss that we had uh in mitchum years ago uh, because that was something we actually were able to help develop uh, in terms of uh, making better cooling packages and everything. And GM actually took a lot of the things that we did on track with those cars and applied them to that first Camaro ZL1 that they came out with, uh, specifically with like engine internal strengthening um, and differential cooling and things like that. So it was cool to see uh, we weren't just racing. We were actually, you know, putting something towards uh, the road cars uh, which was always cool. Um, I really enjoyed that. And we had an old uh, Porsche 9971 that we did uh, 2011 and 12, I believe, that, that was pretty cool. It was a Daytona special. We built it only for this race. Uh, it was intentionally built from a cup car. We didn't widen the bodywork because there was only a bodywork maximum. And of course, all the factory built Porsches were at that maximum. So the car went like hell on the, the banking. We had we lost in uh, in braking and downforce and obviously in the infield, but we more than made up for it on top speed. So that was cool just to have a, a little Daytona special that, to be a part of, which was cool. But I mean, there's there's been so many cars. The KTM Crossbow GT4 was was rad, I and mean, that thing was like a, a miniature bat wheel. And uh, for having such a tiny engine and, and being so far removed from the big V8 Camaros and the Panos and the, the Mustangs and everything else that we raced against. It was like the little car that could, and those things were just so much fun. Uh, you know, we would do um, our mid corner speed at turn four at most sport, which is the second like fall off the earth left-hander would match our top speed at the end of the Andretti straight at most sport. Wow. So you were going as fast mid corner dropping off, two, three, four stories as you would be max at the end of the straight. So those cars were just immense and they would do anything you told them to do. It was, they were great. So there's been, there's been too many and so many. I, I know I haven't answered your question, but <laughs> I've kind of given you in a roundabout way, the, the unsorted top five. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll take it. Uh, I'll wrap it up with one last question here. I know you kind of talked about 
LMP3 predictions early on. So if you're going to make a prediction for the race as a whole, it looks like we should have some good weather pretty much the entire race. So the DPI class and, and the other classes, who do you think, uh, who do you think's the favorite right now? Well, uh, I, I mean, look, uh, I've, I've been involved in that class for quite a while and I'm not going to say anybody, but action express for DPI. I like it. Even, even if there was some tomfoolery going on this weekend, this is the one race where imbalanced BOP matters the least because you can race it back. You can win in the pit stops. You can win with a strategy and there's nobody in that paddock. That's going to beat that team over 24 hours in the pit lane. There's no team in the paddock that's going to outsmart their, their brain trust on the box over a 24 hour period. And I mean, look at their driver lineup. <laughs> it's, yes, fantastic. It, it's, it's tough. And uh, I mean, you look even at the 48 with Jimmy Johnson, who is an extremely competent sports car driver. He's got all these guys around him, the Kumu Kabayashi, Mike Rockenfeld, like all of these guys. You're like, it's the who's who. So that's going to be a strong one. I fully, like, you know, I want those guys to want to, and it's absolutely possible. Uh, for LM, you know, I think the BMWs, for whatever reason, they have their own postal code. They shouldn't be fast here, but they are. <laughs> Uh, and I think they're, they're kind of in a swan song situation anyway, pairing their program down to just the endurance events. And I think we see the writing on the wall for where that's going to continue past 2021. So I look to those guys to be pretty strong. Um, and that's, that's what history tells us to do. Uh, LMP3, it's a toss up. It's going to be uh, whoever doesn't hurt their equipment and force a mechanical failure early and who doesn't hit anything. Again, I, I don't think anybody's going to make it to the end, um, but the guy who goes the longest is going to be the the one who takes care of the equipment, doesn't overcook the brakes, doesn't abuse the curbs, doesn't get anything, doesn't put himself anywhere where he's not supposed to, and uh, just simply has a bit of sensibility and checks out when the GT cars are around him, give him some gap, and you know, just be sensible and, and make it home. That's what this race is all about. So yeah. uh, again, that's a toss up because there's, there's some really good guys out there. I mean, my man, Joao Barbosa is in a P3 car. Uh, so I think as long as that, that team can keep the car underneath of him and his, his drivers stay out of taking unnecessary risks, that's going to be a strong one. I think that's uh, same Creech. Uh, 47 guys that worked with them last year in the prototype challenge calling race strategy. Um, so I think they, they've, they've got a good package, but again, it's, there's so much unknown with these cars. It doesn't matter how well or how much you prepare them. They're still in many ways, untested, untried, untrue. So I think it's going to be anybody's game in that class. Uh, but I would like to see, uh, Joel get another Rolex or, uh, you know, my friends at 47 win one, two, uh, they're pretty, pretty hardworking earnest guys. So that'll be interesting. That'll be an interesting one to watch. And then uh, for GTD, I'm not going to jinx it, but <laughs> we all know we all know why I'm here, and I know why everybody else in that paddock is there. So we're going to see how it plays out, man. Yeah, I was kind of wondering what you were, what direction you were going to take the GTD one there, but uh, well, well done on the answer on on, on that one. I think it's going to be a, a fun class to watch. Cheers, and uh, I last but not least, P2. Not not forgetting them. Yeah. Um, that's going to be an interesting one too, um, simply because there's so many new teams and there's a couple of European expats that have come over, uh, for this one. And, uh, yeah, I mean, Daytona is a different animal, man. So if you, if you haven't had the experience here, it might not, might not help that you have, you know, Robert Kubica or somebody in the car, uh, this thing will chew you up and spit you out. And we've seen that in years past too. So I think that's, that too, it's going to be up there, man. Anybody's game. Uh, and I think they're, that'll be a fun one to watch. I just hope that it's, uh, not too fun for my, my GT car. We stay out of, uh, stay out of each other's way. <laughs> a nice boring race until like the last half hour when you're just way ahead is what you're looking for. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's how you want it, but it's, it's Daytona. <laughs> it's not without drama. Uh, it's not without an issue. It's and really at the end of the day, it comes down to who mitigates the risk the best best doesn't take any unnecessary risk and um simply makes the least number of mistakes pace really doesn't matter here 
especially for this race. There's far too much time to, to make up for it. It's, it's really easy to lose a three minute lead. Yeah. If you're sitting on the side of the circuit going zero miles an hour with uh, <laughs> three wheels. That, that lead's going to go by pretty quick. So, uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, just even years ago when we had the, the massive lead with Action Express that we, we gained overnight because everybody else had so many issues. I think at one point we had a 14 or 15 lap lead and then uh, our engine tried to eat itself. So now we were, now we were, uh, we have this huge lead and we have to, you know, go, go half throttle or something to try to preserve the engine. And, you know, there's still 12 hours left in the race. And so literally anything can happen at this thing. And uh, again, it's, it goes back to, I forget which president made the, made the quote, but it's uh, plans are useless, but preparations are indispensable. I like that. That's a good quote. That's very applicable to this one. <laughs> well, on that note, sir, I listen, I appreciate the time. Best of luck this weekend. Definitely get some rest between now and then. And uh, look forward to chatting again soon. This is a lot of fun and, and obviously hope both of your teams are, are very successful this weekend. That's the idea, man. We're here to, to do one thing, and that's win motor races. So, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. We've had a couple of days to recharge the batteries here. Like I, like I told you earlier, we had yep. a little jog and drive on the beach at Daytona because that's what you do when you're here and you have some time. Uh, but, yeah, no, we're, uh, we're geared up to start getting after it tomorrow. And, uh, race on Friday and race on Saturday, Sunday, man. It's going to be a fun one. And for those who are watching, make sure to check out our social media. I'll do extra posts for, for Trevor's teams and obviously probably do some live streams and stuff. So stay tuned to our social media for the race updates. And Trevor, thank you very much. I wholeheartedly appreciate all the time and uh, definitely have to chat again at some point after the race. Absolutely, man. You've got my number. Uh, it's been a treat. Um, Thank you. happy to be here, man. Happy to, uh, to share my opinion, however bad it is. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I look forward to it. All right, man. Well, listen, I, I appreciate it and, uh, stay safe. You as well, man. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye. See ya.